Africa has been under the influence of France for a quite long time. The French presence in Africa dates to the 17th century, but the main period of colonial expansion came in the 19th century with the invasion of Ottoman Algiers in 1830, conquests in West and Equatorial Africa during the so-called Scramble for Africa, and the establishment of protectorates in Tunisia and Morocco in the decades before the First World War. To these were added parts of German Togo and Cameroon, assigned to France as lead of nations mandates after the war. By 1930, French colonial Africa encompassed the vast confederations of French West Africa and French Equatorial Africa, the Western Maghreb, the Indian Ocean islands of Madagascar, Ronyan, and the Comoros, and Djibouti in the Horn of Africa. Within this African empire, territories in sub-Saharan Africa were treated primarily as colonies of exploitation, while a settler colonial model guided colonization efforts in the Maghreb, although only Algeria drew many European immigrants. Throughout Africa, French rule was characterized by sharp contradictions between a rhetorical commitment to the civilization of indigenous people through cultural, political, and economic reform, and the harsh realities of violent conquest, economic exploitation, legal inequality, and sociocultural disruption. At the same time, French domination was never as complete as the solid blue swords on maps of Greater France would suggest. As in all empires, colonized people throughout French Africa developed strategies to resist or evade French authority, subvert or co-opt the so-called civilizing mission, and cope with the upheavals of occupation. After the First World War, new and more organized forms of contestation emerged, as Western educated reformers, nationalists, and trade unions pressed by a variety of means for a more equitable distribution of political and administrative power. Frustrated in the interwar period, these demands for change spurred the process of decolonization after the Second World War. Efforts by French authorities and some African leaders to replace imperial rule with a federal organization failed. And following a 1958 constitutional referendum, almost all French territories in sub-Saharan Africa claimed their independence. In North Africa, Tunisian and Moroccan nationalists were able to force the French to negotiate independence in the 1950s. But decolonization in Algeria, with its million European settlers, came only after a protracted and brutal war, 1954 to 1962, that left deep scars in both post-colonial states. Although formal French rule in Africa had ended by 1962, the ties it forged continued to shape relations between France and its former colonial territories throughout the continent. Following the accession to independence of its African colonies, France continued to maintain a sphere of influence over the new countries, which was critical to then-President Charles de Gaulle's vision of France as a global power and as a bulwark to British and American influence in a post-colonial world. The United States supported France's continuing presence in Africa to prevent the region from falling under Soviet influence during the Cold War. France kept close political, economic, military, and cultural ties with its former African colonies that were multi-layered, involving institutional, semi-institutional, and informal levels. Something that still felt like bondage to the African countries. For a while now, African countries have been doing the most to kick out France from their countries. After hitting several resets, restoring historic treasures to former colonies, downsizing its military presence, and striking new ties elsewhere on the continent, France's Africa strategy seems at a dead end. Coups in half a dozen former French colonies in West and Central Africa over three years, including two in Niger and Gabon, in just over a month, are sparking fresh souls searching about what went wrong and how, if possible, to put long-standing relations and interests back on track. Yet many suggest Paris can no longer call the shots, as some African governments cut ties altogether and carve new ones with foreign rivals, including Russia. French influence in the Sahel has collapsed, wrote France's influential Le Monde newspaper this past week.
Elsewhere on the continent, it is on the defensive, and nothing Paris says can restore it. That assessment comes as the paper and other media report that discussions between Paris and Niger's military are underway about the withdrawal of some military elements from the African country. Until now, French authorities have refused to recognize the military junta that seized power in Niger in late July, dismissing calls for its ambassador and 1,500 French troops stationed there to depart immediately. The power grab in Niamey followed a now familiar playbook. Not so long ago, Niger, along with neighboring Burkina Faso and Mali, cooperated closely with Paris in a broader Sahel alliance fighting a jihadist insurgency. All three since have seen civilian leaders toppled by their militaries, fathered by protests, sprinkled with Russian flags and slogans calling for the ouster of French forces and diplomats. The latest coup in oil-rich Gabon, once a staunch and long-standing ally of Paris, has taken a different path. Unlike in Niger, there have been no playing loads of French expatriates returning home or massive anti-French rallies. Although Paris suspended military cooperation, even though it has 400 troops in Gabon, it offered a muted reaction to the toppling of long-term leader Ali Bongo by his reported cousin, following presidential elections. Junta leader, General Bryce Oliwingema, has restored the transmission of French broadcasters France 24 and Radio France International cut under Bongo, while the three Sahel coup countries, Burkina Faso, Mali and Niger, continue to keep those news organizations off the air. In a lengthy interview in Le Monde, Foreign Minister Catherine Coloma defended France's Africa strategy. She differentiated the ousting of Niger's democratically elected president, Mohamed Bazoum, with the situation in Chad, where she said Paris counted on Germina's military government, delivering on its promise to restore civilian rule. She said, One cannot see our relations with the continent through the single prism. It's not 3,000 or 5,000 people demonstrating in a stadium in Naomi that can resume our relations with 1.5 million Africans. Catherine Colonna went ahead to say France's position is to listen to Africans, not to decide in their place. For a while, Macron, born after France's last colony in Africa, Djibouti, gained its independence, seemed the right man for the job. I am of a generation that doesn't tell Africans what to do, he told cheering students in Burkina Faso shortly after his election six years ago. Macron pledged to return looted colonial-era artifacts, although only a fraction has been shipped back and sought new ties elsewhere, including with Kenya, South Africa, Ethiopia, and Angola. Like his recent predecessors, he maintained that the tangle of post-colonial business and political ties dubbed Frank Afrique was long dead. In February, Macron promised to draw down French forces in Africa and create a new security partnership, with bases on the continent transformed depending on African needs, and jointly managed with African staff. Skeptics say Macron hasn't always walked his talk. They point to many enduring trappings of French influence, from thousands of troops still stationed in Africa to a raft of long-standing mining concessions, benefiting French companies, and the CFA franc, requiring West and Central African members to deposit half their foreign exchange reserves with the French Treasury. Anti-French sentiment is on the rise in more stable countries, like Senegal, due to a youthful population untethered to the past, but very aware of the challenges of getting visas to France. Critics point to what they consider a series of French missteps too in the Sahel. Despite early wins, France's decade-long counter-terrorism operation, they lost local trust, they say, and finally was shuttered last year amid a spreading Islamist insurgency. Even as France promotes democracy, Skeptics describe a tacit acceptance of some authoritarian governments like Chad. France has so many reasons not to leave Africa, some of them being that the former colonies have to pay a colonial debt. The newly independent countries are forced to pay for the country's infrastructure that France takes credit for building during colonization. The amount of this debt varies depending on what country is paying the debt, 
and how its infrastructure is developed. Secondly, France can automatically confiscate the African country's national reserves. The African country must deposit its national monetary reserves into France's central bank. France has held the national reserves of 14 African countries since 1961. In fact, more than 80% of the foreign reserves of these African countries are deposited in so-called operations accounts, controlled by the French Treasury. It is estimated that France now holds nearly $500 billion of African countries' money in its treasury and will do anything to keep it. Moreover, the African countries do not have access to this money. France allows them to access only 15% of the money in any given year. If they need more than that, they have to borrow at commercial rates from the remaining 85% of their own money that is held hostage by the French Treasury. To make things worse, France fixes a limit on the amount of money the countries may borrow from the reserve. The limit is fixed at 20% of their public revenue in the preceding year. If the countries need to borrow more than that, France vetoes it, giving them full authority over Africa. Jacques-Rine Chirac, former president of France 1995-2007, once said, the French people should accept the fact that a large amount of the money in their banks comes precisely from the exploitation of former colonies on the African continent. Furthermore, France claims the right to exploit any natural resource discovered in the country. France claims it has the first right to buy any natural resources found on the territory of its ex-colonies. The African countries are also not allowed to seek other partners freely thing that is slowly changing. Fourthly, France forces African countries to give preference to French interests and companies in the field of public procurement and public biding. According to government contracts, French companies must be considered first. Only after that can Africans connect with other foreign companies. It doesn't matter if the African countries would benefit from a partner outside of France. As a consequence, in many French ex-colonies, all the major economic assets are in French hands. For example, in Côte d'Ivoire, French companies own and control all the major utilities, that is, water, electricity, telephone, transport, ports, and major banks. The same situation exists in the field of commerce, construction, and agriculture. France claims an exclusive right to supply military equipment and training to African military officers. Through a sophisticated scheme of scholarships, grants and defense agreements attached to the Colonial Pact, the document that sets up the common currency for all Francophone countries, the CFA Franc, African countries send their senior military officers for training in France. The situation in Africa now is that France has trained and nourished hundreds, even thousands of traitors. They are activated when France needs them to commit another coup d'état or create a disturbing political situation inside Africa. France claims a right to deploy troops and intervene in the African country to defend France's interests. Under the conditions of defense agreements and the colonial pact, France claims a legal right to intervene militarily in the African countries and also deploy its troops permanently on their military bases. Recently, this regime has changed in some African countries like Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger. The African countries are obliged to make French the official language of the country and of education. The Francophone cultural and educational system, with several satellites and their affiliates, is supervised directly by the French Minister of Foreign Affairs. African people are pressured to speak French instead of their own languages, which is extremely limiting. It has been suggested that if a person only speaks French, they will have access to less than 4% of humanity's knowledge and information. France's former colonies are still forced to use the colonial currency FCFA, the CFA franc. This evil setup acts as a milk cow for France. It has been condemned by the European Union, but France is not ready to get rid of such a system that drains the African countries of their wealth and brings to about $500 billion annually to the French Treasury. It does not end there. The African countries are obliged to send France 
an annual balance and reserve report. Without the report, the African countries cannot get money from the reserves of the France Central Bank. Also, the central banks of ex-colonies are controlled and managed by the France Central Bank. African countries are also prohibited from entering into any military alliance. African countries in general have military alliances with their ex-colonizers. Moreover, France forbids the Africans from looking for any form of military cooperation and protection outside of that offered by the French government. Lastly, African countries are obliged to ally only with France during a situation of war or global crisis. More than a million African soldiers contributed to the defeat of Nazism and Fascism in World War II. However, this contribution is often ignored or underestimated. Since World War II, France has taken into consideration the fact that Africans may be used in the case of any military threat or war expectation. In conclusion, France has been addicted to looting and exploiting Africa since the times of slavery. There are still French military bases and soldiers in Africa under the pretense of protection. But in fact they are there to control and oppress the local citizens. With all these opportunities, there's no way France will want to leave Africa. Will African leaders succeed to oust France from their respective countries, or it is a lost battle in advance? Keep your comments flooding. Like, share, and subscribe.